Every year we have important people within the gaming industry fucking up real bad. And this is a collection of all those hilarious, controversial, disgusting, ignorant fuck-ups. These are the top 10 gaming controversies of 2013. Number 10. Imagine if when Sony announced the PS4's price at their reveal event, imagine if they said this. I'm very proud to announce that PlayStation 4 will be available for $1,800. They'd be laughed out of the show halls. They would sell barely anything. It would be completely ridiculous, right? Except that's what's happening right now in some Latin American countries like Brazil, where it costs 3,999 real, or around 1,850 US. How in the hell could this thing be as expensive as the big ass state of the art 60 inch LED HD TV it's supposed to be played on? Taxes from the Brazilian government, that's how. Let's break it down. 63% of its price tag is allocated to compensate for the fees and taxes on imported goods in that country. Only 21.5% is the actual PS4 cost itself, around 390 US equivalent. That's what they should be paying. Actually, they should be paying less, our price, but at least that's better than $1,800. Sony said it's trying to negotiate a lower tax burden, but it hasn't happened. And the fact that the console is not manufactured in Brazil has the Brazilian government holding fast. However, there is still one thing for Sony to explain. How then is it that the Xbox One costs nearly half as much in the country? It's still a ridiculous amount, 2,200 reais or 1,000 US. Sources say MS negotiated their better price, so why can't Sony? In any case, the taxes in Brazil are a problem. A deep, old, and crazy problem that gamers over there have had to deal with for a long time. Hopefully their government sees how big the gaming industry is and how it can benefit their own economy in the future and ease restrictions like these. Until then, their only option is to be rich as shit or illegally import them. I'm not saying anything. Number nine. And some of you looked relatively normal in it. One of you looked like a total toss pot in it. But you can't have it both ways. You're successful game designers. You're indie game designers. Hurrah, good for you, you fucking hipsters. spectacular public meltdown and burnout of independent game developer Phil Fish and the subsequent cancelization of Fez 2. Fez 2 is cancelled, he wrote on his company website. I am done. I take the money and I run. This is as much as I can stomach. This isn't the result of any one thing but the end of a long bloody campaign. You win. Fish then tweeted that he fucking hates this industry. Oh, I, it really gets to me, I guess. You know, that's the price you pay for, for being indie and being 
the one guy that people know is making the game is that you, you open yourself to these kinds of personal attacks. And what was all this over? How did this come about? Well, that immediately happened after a very public Twitter argument with games critic Marcus Beer, aka Annoyed Gamer from Game Trailers. Marcus had called Fish a tosspot, a hipster, a wanker, and a fucking asshole on an episode of the Game Trailers video podcast after Fish refused to answer questions about Microsoft's decision to allow indie developers to now self-publish on Xbox One. In retaliation, Fish tweeted that Game Trailers had assassinated his character and told Beer to quote unquote, compare your life to mine and then kill yourself. Asking Beer th to then apologize on camera. It all culminated with the cancelization of Fez 2 and Fish essentially taking his ball and going home. Phil Fish's struggles to bring the original Fez to market were shown in Indie Game The Movie, a documentary released in 2012 and one that I highly recommend you go out and buy right now. If you're interested in the gaming industry at all, it is fucking awesome. And it's not just a game, like it's, I'm, I'm so closely attached to it. It's me, like it's my, my ego. My perception of myself is at risk. This is my identity, it's Fez. I'm guy making fans. You know, that's that's about it. If that doesn't work out, well then I would kill myself. I'm dead. I would kill myself. That's why I'm. Well, that's like my my incentive to to finish it is then I get to not kill myself. I kind of felt sorry though after seeing Phil Fish's personal moments and hardships trying to get his first game made as he was in this very real, legal, tense battle with a business partner. Went down to the wire to get this game to market. And it's still not signed. And he's, he's coming, he's gonna be there and he's gonna come around and check out the game and I'm gonna cold blood fucking murder him. I'm gonna fuck that guy, seriously. which he eventually did to some success, despite some bugs, but it is no excuse for death threats. And if you wanted to be a public figure, which he clearly did, with some very strong opinions on a variety of things on his Twitter account, you just have to, you have to craft your responses. If you even choose to fight back, you, you have to craft those to be more cleverly worded than kill yourself. It's ultimately, a cautionary tale of how being too close and taking things too personal while at the same time being legitimately overworked and stressed can self-destruct someone's very real passion for making games. Many people liked Fez and help. Let's see what Fez 2 was all about. But we may never see him back. I feel like this is just gonna end horribly for everybody involved. Number eight. Now it's one thing to have a developer insult you on Twitter and get pissed off, right, with what you said. But it's quite another to have them get so upset they actually come after your livelihood and try to shut down all your shit and your channel for simple criticism. Well, that's exactly what happened to my friend Total Biscuit and the now infamous and ironically named Day one, Gary's incident. Um, incident. Critique exists to protect consumers from unscrupulous companies and is a necessary part of our society. Wild Game Studio disagrees. A few days ago, I encountered the following message on my YouTube channel. As you can see, this is a standard copyright strike. Three of these and your account is shut down, your videos removed. The breakdown goes like this. Total Biscuit requests a review copy of the game and permission to review and monetize his critique on the game. The CEO replies, agrees, and supplies him with a review code of the game. Stefan replied within 24 hours and gave us a review code. These are the facts. TB then reviews the game, finds it deficient in many areas. Collision detection would be far too much to ask here. Can I... What? What? I hit him five times or three times in the back and he doesn't even know that I'm here. <laughs> Why is this game? 
I don't get to ask, what is this game? What? Now he realizes. Oh, screw everything about this. I'm sorry, I can't take another minute of this dreadful thing. Oh, I... It is... What is it with this year and awful video games? The CEO sees the video, notice it, it's the top rated video and seen video for his game and immediately decides he must find a way to remove this thing from the internet. So in one of the stupidest moves I have ever seen or heard about, the CEO decides, despite having email conversations agreeing to the review, despite letting others monetize videos on his game, despite giving permission to anyone to do videos on his game, he decides to make a copyright claim on TB's review video, potentially applying a strike against TB's channel in order to get this specific negative review taken down. And remember, TB already had two strikes previously. His excuse? TB has no right to make money off of his intellectual property. 100% childish bullshit. And he was rightfully called out in a masterfully articulated response by TB himself. You need to see it. The CEO for Wild Game Studio has since apologized, but this Gary incident incident is proof of how easy it is for companies to abuse the YouTube copyright and content ID systems to make false claims with no merit, with the hopes that their targets don't have the means to, to fight back or don't have a voice to. That shit needs to be fixed. Number seven. After a lackluster launch, Nintendo's new Wii U console has struggled to gain ground. The Wii U is currently having a quote unquote negative impact on the company's profits already at its current price reduction in the US and Europe, bringing in an operating loss of 23.2 million yen during a six month period at one point. Particularly alarming was the information from Nintendo itself that between April 1st and June 30th, the Wii U sold only 160,000 units. That's it, globally, over three months. Even its predecessor, the Wii, managed to outsell its newer brother over that same time period, doing 210,000 units. After so few games released during its initial push, and so few during 2013, the console is failing to live up to expectations. And Nintendo knows it. Their president has said, so far, we failed to make propositions worthy of Wii U's position as a successor to the Wii system. Now, titles like Wind Waker HD, Pikmin 3, and Super Mario 3D World have certainly helped keep the console afloat, but it's just not gonna be enough it's third-party software. Part of the problem has been that lack of third-party support. More and more publishers are deciding against developing titles for the system. Hell, anything at all, not even ports. Pete Hines of Bethesda recently said, The time for convincing publishers and developers like to support Wii U has long passed. Right. Like, the box is out. You, like, you have to do what Sony and Microsoft have been doing with us for a long time, and, and it's not that every time we, we met with them we got all the answers we wanted, but they involved us very early on in talking to folks like Bethesda and Gearbox and saying, here's what we're doing, here's what we're planning, here's how we think it's going to work, to, to, you know, to hear what we thought. If you're going to just sort of decide, like, well, we're going to make our box and this is how it's going to work and you should make games for it, like, well, no. <laughs> like, no is my answer. I, I'm going to focus on other ones that better support what it is we're trying to do. Activision publishing CEO Eric said Nintendo is having a rough go. But guys, it's not dead and buried. Today, the console has sold around 3.91 million units and around 6.3 Wii U games. But Nintendo refuses to readjust its optimistic selling of 9 million consoles before the end of its 2014 financial year. I doubt it can reach that. But perhaps with a price reduction, coupled with, say, Donkey Kong, Zelda, Metroid, and a new kart racer in 2014, can bring the console back into the black. But it's going to need third-party support. Come on, Nintendo. You gotta do this, or you're gonna get knocked out. Number six. I don't know if you guys have noticed this as well, but I'm getting this feeling like, 
more and more companies are thinking it's completely okay and now the norm to charge customers for their betas. Especially free-to-play games. Let's, let's just focus there. Despite them not being finished or even having half of their features in the game, the cash shop is fully functional and already online. MechWarrior Online, Hawken, Infinite Crisis, Hearthstone, many others follow the same model. The point of a beta test is to let players go wild, test the game, break that shit over and over before it goes live. Not to drag out the beta test as long as it's making good money. Betas are supposed to be done in a timely manner so that the full version of the game can be enjoyed, released. Wouldn't giving players unlimited credits and, and in this testing period make more sense than locking off content or making it an incredible time sink to grind in unless they pay money during their testing? You are essentially paying for a reduced version of the game. No, no, let's be honest. These aren't beta tests anymore. They're paid previews. Paid previews. Beta testers should be getting paid to play a broken game, or at least they get early access free of charge for the work they're putting in. But these aren't real betas. The danger of companies getting complacent is high. Some companies put out relatively polished products that's damn near finished, like Hearthstone. So it's less of an issue. Other companies put out something in far less a polished and complete state. Take MechWarrior Online, for example, the game sits in some form of beta for more than a year, barely having any of the promised changes while earning money the whole time with extravagant founders packages going up to $120 a piece. Each mech is going to cost you like $30. I don't know what it is, but it's ridiculous. Each of them, and then, and then, Finally, the game releases into a full version ages later with none of the big features that were being worked on or implemented with a generic TBA attached to them. Now, <clears throat> maybe I'm old school, but the idea of paying $120 during a beta just seems wrong to me. I wonder if anybody else agrees. This is one trend that I hope doesn't get too carried away. It's walking a very thin line at the moment. But if other games, like retail games, start to see this become the norm, they're going to jump in too, having us pay full price to essentially test their game. Hell, it's already happening. <coughs> Battlefield 4! And you know it. Number 5. Shutting down LucasArts. Star Wars 1313 cancelled. I grew up on LucasArts games, so when I heard that the company was being shut down, I was devastated. Sure, they made some questionable decisions lately, for like refusing to see the obvious demand for Battlefront and just favoring crappy watered-down titles that just exploits its own babies. But I feel like it deserved a second chance, and I think we were about to get one, rather than them just being completely gutted. The newest Star Wars 1313 was actually starting to look rather impressive. It too was cancelled, never to see the light of day. Completely unfair. This was the company that gave us Monkey Island, Grim Fandango, Sam and Max, Rebel Assault, and my all-time favorite, the X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter games. Disney shutting down LucasArts marks a sad end to an era, and while technically the name itself will live on as some licensing shell, it won't ever be the same. The concern now is that the new companies that Disney selects 
will treat their licenses with care and respect. But so far, things don't really look all that great. Star Wars Attack Squadrons is being announced and developed by Area 52 and Disney Interactive, and it screams freemium to play, lazy with Area 52 not having one game under their belt. But according to LinkedIn, they specialize in mobile games, browser-based games, and advert gaming, which never sounds good. And while DICE's Battlefront sounds exciting, seeing the way they handled their most recent release and the condition it was in, they've given any fan reason to pause. Please treat these games with respect, Disney and EA. You now, reluctantly, are our only hope. Resist the dark side. Number four. What am I looking at? Serious? No. Okay. No. You know what I've what? had enough of, EA? Is your fucking bullshit. That's what I've had enough of. Battlefield 4, you done fucked it up. You done fucked up Battlefield 4. You want to know why? Oh, to increase your bottom line, right? Oh, does the game work right? No. The siege of Shanghai crash every five no. seconds when the building explodes? Yes. Is it fucking garbage? Does shit run like garbage? None of it is optimized? Yeah? And this shit is still happening. This shit is still happening. This is how you repay the hard work of everybody who dumps $120 like a ridiculous amount into a game. You can't even fucking enjoy it right. It is clear to me that with all its problems, this game was pushed out the door way too early and under questionable circumstances. Hell, so questionable that EA now faces not one but two lawsuits over the state of Battlefield 4. I am fucking tired of releases like these. And it's not just limited to Battlefield, there was the disastrous SimCity. Ready, go! Work, damn it! Work, damn it! Work, damn it! Whoa, well, what the hell? Work, damn it! Work, damn it! Work, damn it! Ah, uh, there we go. Fuck it, I'm going to bed. Unless we pick on EA too much, you can add the equally disastrous X Rebirth launch. I am unable to entertain you further at this time, my young one. Please run along. Doc. Docking permission granted as well as Total War Rome 2. If a company wants to put out games in these conditions to make a quick buck, or to get some sort of return on their investment, they should be prepared for all the criticisms, lawsuits, and loss of customer confidence and loyalty that results from it. Maybe then, companies will think about their reputation and their loyal fan bases and their franchises first, rather than the bottom line. From here on out, I refuse to let any of these disastrous launches slip through the cracks like I did with SimCity at X Rebirth. If another one of these happens in 2014, and it will, please let me know with detailed information of what's going on. And I'll do my best to relay that information to my audience and any potential buyers. Gamers are sick and tired of paying full retail price or more to be your beta testers and your honeypots. You guys have been warned. Number three. Mario! Ah! Help! Here we go. Anita Sarkeesian. 
and the gross sexism among gamers. Just the mere mention of this girl's name will blow up your comments section with some of the most disgusting hate and ignorance I have ever seen. And it depresses and angers me that some of my own fans engage in it and post it. Go ahead, look for yourself. Just scroll down to the comments and you can see how hateful and stupid it is. If you can't take a dissenting opinion or someone that disagrees with you, then why the hell are you even subscribed to any review or editorial channel at all? There is one other thing that I have to bring up when you talk about Anita Sarkeesian. Yes, there is a video of her saying that she's not a gamer. She doesn't like playing games. She doesn't like shooting people and think that that shit is gross. That's true. I'm gonna show you a remix that I just finished this weekend and no one else has seen. <laughs> one person has seen it. It's a soundtrack of one song, except I'm doing video games. So it's not exactly a fandom. I'm not a fan of video games. I actually had to learn a lot about video games in the process of making this. To me, the song is positive just because I've only contextualized it in a way to critique male domination in our media. And also, video games, like, I would love to play video games, but I don't want to go around shooting people and ripping off their heads, and it's just gross, so... Hence, this is my react response to that. It's also probably extremely likely, I'm talking 99.9%, uh, that she uh, borrowed Let's Play footage from Cubex55 on YouTube without giving them credit. Those two things are true. I personally would like to see her apologize for using and uh, the footage and not crediting those people. I don't know if she's ever publicly apologized for that, but that is one definite thing that she needs to apologize for. However, whether she's a hardcore gamer or not, she is entitled to her opinion. She says she's a gamer. She says she has a love-hate relationship with gaming because of what she finds offensive in it. Whatever. It doesn't matter. That's not the point that I'm trying to bring up here. What I'm trying to point out is the gross overreaction that some people had to somebody challenging the status quo. Somebody with a dissenting opinion. Somebody with a different point of view. It is 100% true that 4chan attacked her. It is 100% true that she has YouTube personalities who make constant videos attacking her daily, all the freaking time. Feminist Frequency, Anita Sarkeesian, the old war corpse is sorry. Sorry about the fact that you're so full of shit! That you live in Santa Monica, California. I live here in Minnesota. And God damn it, woman, you reek all the way here. I'm sorry about the fact that you sit there and you got $150 plus thousand dollars from your friends, family, and fans to make a video series that is so full of shit. Fucking, fucking Walt Disney was more truthful. And all you've done, instead of focusing on your video series, all you've done is cry. Trying to get her videos pulled down. Uh, after 14 months of making videos and comments and commentary about Miss Anita Sarkeesian, and she showcased one of my tweets. <laughs> As you can see, it's in the top uh, right-hand corner, and the internet is finally striking back. Keep flagging, uh, keep fighting, keep flagging. And of course, yes, I'm promoting people to flag her video, and yes, that can be construed as an attack, but I ultimately said that, well, here's two things. One, I never actually flagged her video. I don't like to flag videos on YouTube. Whatever, it's kind of pointless. I mean, I'll watch it, and then I won't ever watch it ever again. So for me, it doesn't matter. But, <laughs> and this is why I tweeted out what I tweeted out. When she, if you looked at her Twitter at the same time, she was talking about that she was visibly irritated that this is going on. She was visibly irritated, right? Now, after 14 months of me being one of the more vocal ones against her, or at least against certain practices of which she participates, she finally found a way to take a shot at me by claiming that I'm one of the ones, by trying to showcase that I'm one of the ones that had her video flagged, when in truth, I didn't flag anything. She likes to, she is probably under the assumption that I did, or she's trying to paint me as a person that did do that. Now, well, I recommended it and tweeted it out to my, 
I think I had about 14,000 followers on Twitter at that point in time. Uh, you know, I can understand that, you know. But then again, here's the truth, Miss Sarkeesian, because I know you're listening. Because like me, you're a narcissist and you like to read everything about you on the internet. It is, it is absolutely true that there are many people out there that flag her videos for no fucking reason other than they don't like her. And that is the controversy that I'm talking about. That shit is wrong. All of because of what she's saying. I'd like to think that in gaming, we can listen and disagree with other points of view without getting into some of the shit that we've seen that Anita has had to go through. Look, <clears throat> this could be its own video, but I'll try to sum it up like this. The issue and controversy isn't whether Anita is right or wrong in pointing out the actual and real damsel in distress trope and doing a series about it. No, the controversy and issue is the gross reaction to it by many butthurt man children and actual clueless little boys who think that this woman is out to take away their porn and video games permanently and that she will somehow actually end up doing that. They fear and knee-jerk react to this so hard they actually fail to see how stupid it makes them look in the process, either by going on about how feminism is a blight on the world, or how every single thing Anita says is completely fabricated and society doesn't ever do those things. The woman has a right to point out and criticize whatever she sees fit without death threats and, and, and emails coming over and people saying they're gonna rape her and stupid ass shit like that. Let's see now. Historically, in a male-dominated game industry, has the damsel in distress trope been used over and over? You bet your ass it has! Would it be cool if developers continued to explore other stories in addition to those? Yes, it would! Does it sometimes make women feel uncomfortable to be over-sexualized non-stop in the games that they play daily? Sure, and maybe that's something that you will never understand or even care about. But do they have a right to say something about it without being called a feminazi? Without getting death threats or rape threats? Hell yes they do, and I'll defend their right to do it against anyone. Look guys, Real talk now, okay? The, the ladies, can you excuse us for a second? Come here, man. No one is ever gonna take away your porn. No one's ever gonna take away our male power fantasies. Big badass muscle dudes and badass power armor killing countless people and having sex with scanty clad women. No one is ever gonna take away those games with the ridiculously sexy and non-functional female armor designs that we Google at and look at their ass. Many men love this. And guess what? Many women like these too. And as long as they sell, they will always exist. So calm the fuck down. And this next thing is gonna blow your fucking mind. Trust me, many feminists fucking love sex. They love sex in video games just as much as men, whether it's Mass Effect or Witcher 2. And if it's done right, it adds to the story and personal connection to the game and characters. It's hot. But when it's done poorly, it feels out of place and just an excuse to show a booby to an immature crowd. Given the choice, you'd pick boobs that are worth a damn every single time. And so would they. So take a breather and realize it's perfectly fine for women to ask questions, to criticize pointless, exploitative material, and to look forward to more games that elevate their gender women, to more than just goals and objects to be won or saved, but into legitimate heroes in their own right. And after all that, if you still don't get it, bro, and you think she should die and every feminist with her, it's because number one, you're a fucking idiot. Number two, you couldn't give a shit about anyone but yourself. And number three, outside your mother, you've never had to actually care about what other women think or feel. Say, a gamer girlfriend. Or hell, in the future, your own daughter. Imagine that, and the game she'll play. And like it or not, more and more women are gamers, just like you and I. So instead of completely dismissing their concerns, maybe, just maybe, 
take a little more time to listen to what they feel, why they feel they've been mostly marginalized in games. I look forward to games that take more time building their female personalities rather than just using them as tools or helpers that throw you things. And you should too, because frankly, that's going to lead to far more interesting stories, opportunities, and new experiences. And honestly, guys, we're always going to have our stripper mini games and our princess savers. So why not campaign alongside them to see more mature games rise for everyone else as well? God damn. Be reasonable, dudes. Fuck. I hope. I hope I got through to some of you that make really stupid, disgusting arguments in the comments. I hope I got through to you guys, at least some of you. That's all I gotta say about that for right now. Think about it. Number two. You idiots. I, I, no. <laughs> you f***ing idiots! Part two! Need I say any more on this? Microsoft tried to restrict and control just like they've always done. You've seen it in Xbox Live Arcade for countless years. Hell, you've seen it countless times. Only this time. They tried to do it on a massive scale with your game purchases, and the consumers resoundingly replied back with a no f thank you. For a while, though, it appeared as if they were going to hold their steadfast position on their new DRM policies. They can't change them. However, after taking a look at their pre-orders in GameStop and Amazon and looking at the grand scheme of things, they made the extremely wise decision to reverse and flip that switch to return the console to its unrestricted state. Now, whether it stays this way or not is anyone's guess, but it certainly was the right decision for both gamers and for the company, as sales numbers do not lie. The Xbox One has been selling like hotcakes, and it's keeping up neck and neck with the PlayStation 4 every bit as wanted. But would it have been that way if Microsoft never reversed its decisions? If they said, screw you guys, this is what you're getting, tough shit? Hell the fuck no, they'd be in trouble. But that's a good thing. It's a win-win. And while their TV and Kinect strategy looked ridiculous at the initial reveal, many people are happy with those features in the final product. And while I myself have never need of them because when I game, I actually game and I don't want to be distracted by a bunch of fucking pop-ups. When I watch Game of Thrones, I want to watch Game of Thrones. When I game, I want to game. Others are finding it next gen to be able to snap things to the side and, and talk to their console, even with some problems and some misses in voice recognition here and there. Now, the Xbox faithful can enjoy their television and their upcoming exclusive programming like the Halo TV show on a console that's more inclusive, more functional, less big brother, and free of pointless nanny restrictions, as if we needed any more of those in the times that we live in. Number one. What the f YouTube? You guys are being complete f***ing assholes. What the hell happened to you? I cannot believe you're doing this. This is wrong. This is stupid. The biggest gaming controversy has to be something that's both very real and very near and dear to my heart. Something that is essentially a direct attack on gamers themselves from the companies that they earn money from. The YouTube copyright policy disaster. And make no mistake, it's a disaster. Both YouTube and the managed networks are at fault. These managed networks created to take on the legal responsibilities and police their talents. But after everything, we are the ones that are ultimately being punished. 
Over 62 of my videos have been claimed. And while I've gotten that number down to only 49, mostly on my own, it's still every bit of a problem and borderline illegal what's going on. Companies are claiming videos that contain just 17 seconds of their video or trailer or song. In most cases, after they were reworked or remixed. And now, they're earning 100% of the revenue, even if it was a 30 minute long video. Well guess what, they have zero rights to the other 29 minutes and 43 seconds. And just because they have 17 seconds, they get all the money? This is a broken system that YouTube devised, clearly as a way to make even more money off the videos that are uploaded every day. More so than to protect copyright holders. It's the big companies that have all the power. Oh, and they know that. They know all that. They simply have to submit a claim, then automatically reject your dispute, and they can intimidate you down with the threats of lawsuits or of YouTube shutting down your channel through strikes automatically. If after you file the appeal, the studio still doesn't want your video up, they can issue a takedown notice. Now, once this happens, your video is automatically removed and you have a strike on your account. However, you can also get past this. It just takes more fucking waiting. From your video manager, you can issue something called a counter notification. All you have to do is fill out the form saying the exact same fucking thing that you've already copied and pasted about why your video is fucking fair use and not violating any copyright. And this is the part that might bug some people, but filing a counter notification is considered a legal action. That means that by filing it, you are essentially telling the copyright holder fucking sue me. Now something really important to note about this is that no studio or copyright holder is that fucking stupid that they will actually try to sue you. This step is basically just calling their bluff. I've been doing this for three years and not been sued once. Now that being said, if your content actually is infringing on copyright, then of course they're gonna sue you. But if you're abiding by fair use, which is the majority of YouTubers, then you have nothing to worry about. And by that I mean you have nothing to worry about except having to deal with this frustrating, tedious bullshit. Once you send it, it then takes up to 10 business days to process. After processing, it can take up to 14 days after that point for your video to be restored. Now during this long period of time, since the video was removed, you do have a strike on your account this whole time. Meaning that if if you have any other reinstated claims in your inbox, you cannot file appeals until your account is back without the fucking strike. Now it's important to note that if you have three strikes on your YouTube channel, your account gets removed. I'm assuming that there's a way to fight that as well, but because that rule exists, even though I'm allowed to file three appeals at a time, I only ever allow myself to have two open at a time just in case they all come back with takedown notices. Because based on my understanding, it seems as though even if all three of those takedown notices are illegitimate, your account will be completely fucking gone until you can and get that taken care of. And if the only way to take care of those takedown notices is to issue more counter notices, then the account could be gone for almost a fucking month. And if you think about it, if a studio or copyright holder was malicious enough to want to fuck you over in the worst way possible, from the initial dispute, they could wait 29 days until they reinstate their claim. And then after your appeal, they could wait another 29 days to issue a takedown notice. So even if you're responding to everything in your copyright inbox as soon as it's sent to you, there's a possibility that your video might not be monetizable for up to three fucking months. Now, I've never experienced it that bad before, but believe me, it is possible. Another thing to note about how retarded their content ID system is, is that somehow over time, claims are able to be reissued from the exact same studios for the exact same footage on videos where disputes have been resolved. It makes no fucking sense. And crazy enough, these options weren't even available three years ago. It used to be that you couldn't fight back against your video getting removed, but now it's at the point where even if it takes fucking forever, and even if more claims are coming in that you can process at a time, which is kind of fucking stupid, you will still be able to post your video in the end, even if it takes fucking forever and is the most frustrating thing in the world. And if they wind up not changing anything, then I guess just use this video to try and make the best of it. But I seriously do hope something changes, because this system is fucked. Which means, even if I wanted to fight all 49 of my claims, I can't! If just three of those companies issue DMCA's to my channel, my channel is fucked, automatically shut down due to the three strike rule. I can't even fight this. I'm still stressing out in this clearly unfair and biased system. Do, do I fight every single one of these companies on fair use in a court of law? Every single one? Or do I give in because I'm risking my business, my personal assets, my future, my livelihood, and the last five years of hard work? I don't know, and I wish to God I knew. All I know is that someone needs to do something. I'll see you guys on the next 
Angry Joe Show.